Well, all right, Jorge Suarez, welcome back to the program. Hey, it's great to be here, Jonathan. Thank you so much for having me over again. Yeah, you know, last time that you were on the program, it was you and your wife together. And yes. so uh, this time we've got you flying solo, but we've also, we're also going to be re- uh, doing a podcast with your wife on another date. So I'm looking forward to that. But um, I was really excited when, uh, when I reached out to you and said, hey, do you have anything else that's kind of stirring in your life? And then you came back and really wanted to talk about um, this idea of uh, health and integrity in leadership. And the yes. the first question I actually want to ask you, Jorge, before you dive into that, and maybe it feels like, well, what a weird kind of basic question. But first <laughs> of all, how would you define leadership and why is leadership even important to life, to the church, to our faith? Man, uh, that's a great question, Jonathan. Uh, leadership really carries a responsibility to lead others, but we, you know, when when the calling is off, then you're gonna see that that is it's kind of a domino effect upon the body as well. So you cannot um, find a healthy church unless unless it has a healthy leadership. So my my burden over this last couple of years, it's been there for for much longer. But it's now kind of finding a voice, and 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 we'll probably talk about it in a, in a little bit. No, uh, it's just to protect leadership from more failure, from burnout, because uh, leadership uh, typically, uh, you know, when they're exposed to all the kind of work that that is taking place on a regular basis at churches, and I, this is also applicable for regular institutions like for mainstream uh, leadership in general is at risk. We hear stories. We, we hear over and over headlines and, and another great leader that collapsed, just, just another failure, another fall. And it breaks my heart every time I, I, I pick up an article, open up an article online, social media, and learn about another spiritual leader that, is, that is, uh, has collapsed. Because uh, I think uh, part of it is, you know, how, what are you doing to protect yourselves uh, when you have such a great calling in your life? Uh, what 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 is what is the the self care that you're giving yourself? What what are you allowing yourself to? What are you exposing yourself as a leader to protect the role and the calling, the vision that God has given you? So it is a, a very very uh, heavy uh, concern in my heart. This yeah. Days. So I'd love to hear just kind of what has been happening over the last couple of years that's gotten you to this point where you've got this growing passion on this subject. And um, and then I'd love to explore some specific questions with you in regards to, you know, all of the dynamics that can happen in um, in leaders and how we can help to protect them, but also be able to restore them even. Absolutely. Well, I don't know if you know, Jonathan, but I'm uh, I'm in school full time (laughs) back to school after uh, I'm in my 50s already. But you know what? God prompted my spirit one morning and, and he said, very, very clearly, Jorge, you need to go back to school to get your doctor uh, program. So uh, I cannot say that I was happy to hear that <laughs> because our lives is already so busy. You know, we're always traveling. We're speaking here and there. We're writing books. We're, we're producing. We're doing counseling therapy in our office. We do intensive clinics with couples. We do all kind of work uh, in the mental health. And yet now I'm hearing from God that I need to go back to school. Well, uh, I obeyed and I jumped right into my doctor program and it's in pastoral counseling um, that I'm uh, completing this degree. Uh, that's my cognate. And I, I, I graduated in, in three months from now. So I'm, it's really exciting. It's been an exciting journey. Over the last, it was nothing near to where I am now because typically when you are working on your doctor's program, you have to ha- come up with a thesis, a problem, and then a solution that you suggest that you're proposing. And it was not not even near to where it ended up being. So as I kind of uh, continue in the program earlier stages, I something hit me really heavy, and I believe this is from the Lord, and it was about leadership. What can I do to protect leadership from more failure, it was very clear, and burnout? So obviously, there's four uh, areas of vulnerability that we're dealing with in this program that I'm creating. I'm, I am creating a suggestion. It's already 
very well developed. So you, you're probably going to hear more about it as well. So the, the four main areas of concern are the emotional, the spiritual, the relational, when it comes to relationships, marriage, and family, and then the sexual. So it's a four, uh, yeah, it's four forces that we need to uh, conquer in this, in this uh, quest so that those leaders can be protected. Okay, can you so say those? Yeah, so yeah, it's so the emotional, spiritual, emotional, spiritual, relational, and sexual. And sexual. How did you? The, how relational, did you, the relational part includes relationship with God and relationship with others. Okay. So how did you uh, kind of come to those four lanes or those four elements uh, in terms of trying to deal with this issue of leadership, uh, failure, and burnout? Well, I figure that if someone is not uh, content at their workplace, if someone is having some issues with their leadership, with their senior leadership, or with their overseer, um, if they have issues with family, with marriage, I don't think they're going to optimize their vocation. I don't think they're going to be at, a, at the best place to serve the body of Christ in this case, if we're talking about a church, or to serve their, their institution at large. Uh, there's something going to be holding them back. And I feel that my job uh, realizing this is to, to offer uh, options. And uh, the way that we have cra crafted this, this is, I have, I have a name and everything. It's called CLARA. Uh, CLARA is the acronym for Comprehensive Leadership, Emotional, and Relational Assessment. The assessment is already created. I joined forces with a doctor in, based in San Bernardino, Dr. Adams, and he helped me design this assessment, uh, professional assessment, so we can measure those four areas of vulnerability. Uh, say you are a leader at your church. Uh, of course, the church is, is welcoming me, my service, you know, as, a, as an agent, as a third par party to come and, and render my services there. Say you're struggling with, um, I don't know, some sexual issues, right? Well, within the assessment, you're going to be given the opportunity to voice out your struggles. And again, the problem, the main problem is the lack of accountability in these institutions, right? Because uh, oftentimes we hear people failing and leaders failing over and over, and they come from a church. It doesn't matter the size. They just come from a spiritual organization. And yet they're fighting the reality of not receiving support, not feeling that they're loved enough, that they're cared enough uh, properly. And they're struggling because they feel that if they expose some vulnerable areas in their lives, they're going to lose their jobs or uh, nobody's really going to care or, or they're just going to be put in discipline or, or taken away from, from their, their uh, you know, their, their, their task or their uh, regular, uh, their daily uh, responsibility. So it's a very difficult place to be as a leader. Yeah, you don't want to expose too much. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that for a little bit, because I think um, sometimes the way that leadership positions within a church uh, are set up, it almost lends itself toward failure. Can you talk a little bit about the structural uh, aspects that need to be addressed in the in the system of kind of how an organization is structured in order to try to create opportunities for the greatest health for their leaders? Absolutely. Let's start with the right foundation. I'm going to read out of, out of Hebrews uh, chapter 13, verse 17. It's a very very traditional verse. Everybody knows about it on leadership. So it reads like this. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. We all understand that, right? And then he says, do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. So what this verse is telling me that, yeah, we as followers, for lack of a better uh uh, you know, like a better word, we as followers, we want to kind of be in a contentment space when I'm following the leader because I should be seen and receiving the proper support. I should be seeing their life's model health 
and I should be totally okay to follow their leadership. But what happens if I'm not seeing that in my church? What happens if, if someone is out of order, someone is out of line, someone is, uh, you know, joking? Uh, typically, some, some of the tendencies for sexual issues and stuff, they are related to sexual jokes. And there's, there's this senior pastor who's constantly giving all these kind of weird jokes on se sexual content, and you feel so uncomfortable. So who's, who's doing anything about that? Who's taking action? to confront this person, to find out what's going on. Why is this triggering uh, in this, you know, why is he uh, appeal to, to be talking so much about sex or jokes or whatever? That's just a single example, but it could be any other area. It could be a leader that is so committed to the, to the work of God, which is mostly where my compassion really gets ignited at, at its most, because I see them give their lives away for sake of others. They are compassionate people. They have a true vocation. They have a true calling in their lives. And yet the calling is totally sabotaged due to the lack of, of, of accountability. And I know, Jonathan, accountability is a word that has kind of a negative connotation because you, you, you talk about accountability. People kind of could be resistant about it because, it, oh, so that means I am forced to talk about my private issues or Oh, now I'm in post. I have to do something that I don't want to do. Well, the truth is that if you are serving in a spiritual institution, according to what the word of God tells us, we, we have to be transparent. We have to be open and vulnerable because that's, I think people are sick of, uh, of a facade. They, they're sick of a mask. They want to see the real thing. And we can no longer keep mask on if we are truly proclaiming the name of Jesus. So we need to do something with the leadership so that they understand that the accountability starts with them. And that's what, what's happening in many places where the senior leadership is not embracing accountability as part of their, their actual calling. So they become these big CEOs or big headed person. Nobody has access to them. They are untouchable. And then they become, and they believe they, they are that. When in reality, they're only servants of, of, of Jesus. And Jesus modeled quite some uh, leadership that we should all emulate. Yeah, so I think sometimes also when people hear that term accountability in the context that we're talking about it, they only think of it often at the tail end of when failure has sort of blown up. And now it's like, okay, we're going to hold this leader accountable, which usually looks like run him out of town exactly. on a rail, kick him out. All right. And now we're just going to move on with somebody new. So, so true. what true. does the idea of transparency and what you're describing as accountability, what does that look like when the leader is in place? Like how, how does a, how does a church begin to organize itself in a way that says, we need that transparency because here's what I'm thinking, uh, Jorge. I'm, I'm thinking, you know what? This sounds awesome. And I don't know how many churches would let you in their front door with that message. <laughs> yeah, I, I because, agree. Like you said, sometimes, hey, this leader, they become kind of like a, a rock star in their in their context. And it's like, don't move my cheese. Don't mess with my life. Don't mess with our system. <laughs> So how do you expect to kind of get this message into where it actually needs to be for leaders to thrive? Well, the 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 solution to that, because I, I figure, I mean, think about this. I've been processing this program for, for, for the last couple of years. And uh, part of the solution to that is actually it's going to be a, a confidential assessment. So even when your senior pastor agreed that I would come as a third party to serve your institution, uh, the, the outcome is confidential. I don't have a freedom to share with anybody. It's just like, you know, the, the liability and the, the, the confidentiality that I apply in my, in my practice, uh, my counseling practice here, is the same applies for this organization, for Clara, uh, for the assessment. So I cannot, I'm not at liberty to share any of the outcome uh, with anybody, including the senior pastor. That's the agreement. So everybody goes into this assessment with that confidence. And, and every, after every segment of the assessment, like oh, touching on those four areas of vulnerability that we discussed earlier, then there's going to be an open 
fields where you can actually express whatever it is that that might be bothering you. If we didn't touch it on the on the questions, you you have the freedom to express. Again, I'm giving leaders a, a voice so they can share their struggles. Trust this third party outside because I don't want to create a, either a power struggle between coworkers. So you see, there was a possibility to introduce the program, the assessment, with someone that is already in staff, uh, say in the human relationship department or whatever, but that can create a friction because then I'm not going to open up to someone who, who worked with me and then stab me on my back. You know, all those kind of situations could be avoided by providing a third party outside the institution coming as a professional with a professional label. We're going to serve your, your community, your church, or your uh, organization, and then we're going to identify what are those issues that are, um, you know, mostly uh, disturbing your staff individually. And then I also have the, 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 the great joy to know that my, through my assessment, I can measure the health of the institution at large. So we can not only measure individually, but also see where most of the staff is struggling. So we can provide workshops and, and trainings uh, in those areas as needed. Now, getting really, really practical, um, uh, if the statistics bear out, and I actually think they're highly conservative to what is actually occurring in many uh, uh, pastors around the, the nation here, at least in the United States, uh, is roughly 40 to 50 percent of current pastors have a current struggle with pornography. And like we mentioned before, like you said before, man, so many times these positions have been set up for secrecy, like they just do not have an outlet. Thinking on a really, really practical level, you've got a pastor here that let's say he's got a current struggle with pornography. Um, man, how, and, and he does not feel safe enough in his current context because he's like, I know for sure if I told anybody, if I told an elder, if I told anybody that I'm, I'm done. I mean, the only protocol that's ever been in place at this church historically has been kick them out. Um, right. How do you practically help that pastor? Like what needs to come around him? What needs to happen? Not only institutionally, but just personally for that pastor to be able to um, come into this space of of freedom and accountability and um, community where maybe that hasn't been present before in his experience. I think, Jonathan, if, if I gain his trust and he can confide in me as his personal, you know, counselor or someone that 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 is not internal, that he can actually reach out uh, because I'm going to come in with a proposal. I'm going to propose to them, you're probably going to need a certain number of sessions. Let's just uh, get you really working on this. The idea is not to come with, with a judgmental approach whatsoever. The idea is to give them the opportunity to voice out their struggles so they can see hope and they can receive the proper support. Because I don't care what position you're, you're fulfilling right now. I don't care if you're messed up in, in your emotions you're still serving in a role that God has called you. And, and think about David, King David. I mean, a man who had it all. I mean, this kingdom, powerful, uh, whatever. And then he messed up. And do you think he voluntarily came to, to tell everybody what happened? No, you know the story. He, the prophet has to come. God had to speak to the prophet to confront King David so that he could open his heart and confess his sin. So it's the same, the same thing. I, I feel that God can use our institution or myself or whomever is going to be working with us to provide them a, 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 an opportunity to, to experience freedom just by reaching out. You know, the first step in, in, in recovery is accountability. If you don't voice out your struggle, you'll never be free. So it's, it's really up to you. It's between you and God. What do you want to do with your life? Do you want to remain a slave of sin? Do you want to be consumed by these thoughts that are forcing you to, to do things that you don't want, uh, you know, unwanted behaviors. What, what do you want to do with your life, your leadership, your calling, your profession, whatever you want to call it? So it's up to the leader to choose accountability. Okay, We're not so forcing anything. Now, yeah. yeah, let's say now we've got a pastor. Maybe we've got a whole whole team. But first of all, let's just talk about the individual. Let's talk about the leader. 
you've got a leader now that says, um, I want to live with sexual integrity and I want to try to prevent the burnout that can happen so often in ministry. Or, hey, what what path do you get that guy on? What 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 is the process then for that leader to actually engage in this? What does that look like from what you're proposing? Well, we're going to engage into some uh, regular therapies, sessions, support, so we can understand the root of the issues. Where is this coming from? We got to deal with that. We got to we got to provide some CBT, some cognitive behavioral therapy, so that the person can realize what is triggering what those urgent urgencies, right? So once it's able to identify the root through therapy, then we can start setting some boundaries in place so that he knows every time. And then the, the support, like maybe get him into a group of leaders like him that would be actually, uh, you know, accountable to, to, to one another. You need to fight this fight. This fight is not to be fought alone. Uh, sexual struggles, as you know, uh, Jonathan, you have to get it out of your system and find a brother that is going to be there for you when you need to reach out. I run a support group. I've been running a support group of men for recovery for probably seven years now. And Jonathan, I've tried to to like like get rid because, you know, get rid of the group. Like I, I'm done. I, I need more time. To, even for, when I started this program, the doctor program, and I have, they have not been able to let go. They don't want to let go. This is, they, they call it their lifeline. And we have established such an, an amazing family and community in this group. And it's not larger than 10 guys, but we meet every single week. Every Tuesday, we're there. They're, they call, it's a conference call thing. So they call and we report uh, how uh, our weeks went, uh, what kind of struggles we had, what kind of victories are we celebrating this week? Because remember, recovery is not just uh, dumping us and, and, and crucifying us when we fail. It's also celebrating the smallest victories. So they have become so, so, uh, it is a bond that, that on, it's a spiritual bond that has come out of this group. And beyond that, it's a family. It's a community of believers that are fighting together for the same cause. And they feel that they have been noticed and they have been heard in their pain. And you, could, you should hear those men talk to each other. The way, the authority that God has given them through their freedom is beautiful. So you know what? I, I know I had to keep the group going, but it's like, oh my gosh, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to let them go either. So we're going to keep, I keep, uh, but it's a very, there's a core of like three, four guys that have been there forever and they don't want to let go. So, you know, I'm going to be there trying to provide that support that I have promised. Mm hmm yeah, so, but, so but yeah, accountability is key to to freedom. Yeah, obviously, there's got to be community and support there. Um, let's talk for a second about um, what happens when there has already been a moral failure of some kind. So, um, talk us through what needs to happen first for that individual, because we don't want to lose the individual in just the process of the the larger context but also what needs to happen maybe organizationally around that leader um, if there's going to be first of all just reconciliation for the relationships that have been hurt but even the possibility of restoration and what that can even look like and should restoration even ever be considered 100 percent, yes i i i try to think through the mind of Jesus. What would Jesus do in a situation like that? What would Jesus do with a leader that has been serving faithfully for years, years, years in, in the same church, the same place? And all of a sudden he had a glitch. He had a situation that compromises his, his ability to serve uh, at, the, at the level that is expected. Well, I think I would, the first thing is to have that conversation with the leader they need to understand the, the degree of the magnitude of what has happened. I think if they have, depends on their attitude, Jonathan, many leaders, because they come from that prideful and big headed type of approach, they feel that, well, I'm the head here. And if I'm not here, this is going to, nothing's going to work. Well, it depends on their attitude, because if they're in that humble approach to, to the situation, what happened and true repentance then true restoration can take place. 
So repentance is very much associated with uh, with restoration. There's yeah. not ever a restoration that is going to take place if you don't if you don't come wholeheartedly acknowledging what happened and admitting to your mistake. So that's I, that's kind of a first step. And I would say in that idea of repentance, how this is something that doesn't get talked about a lot. But I'd love for, to hear what you have to say about this. You know, sometimes we think of leadership. And unfortunately, we take the world's idea of leadership and superimpose it into uh, the church in terms of what leadership is. And, and the general idea is leadership is like a top down, uh, you know, power issue. And and the reality is, is in, in the church, leadership is a is a bottom up service issue. So how important it, is it for that that Christian spiritual leader to actually have themselves submitted to other followers of Jesus in their pursuit of greater integrity and greater leadership and all that. How important is the is the role of actually a leader being in a submissive posture um, rather than like an overpowering, like I'm the domineering, I'm the one in control? Well, if you truly want to portray Jesus, you need to operate the way Jesus operated. You really have to follow his footsteps. Jesus showed us the most humble approach to leadership, servanthood, and to the point that he died to self. And he gave his, his, himself as a sacrifice for others. So I think when you, when you bring it into the context of, a, of an institution, I don't care how large you are. I don't care how much growth God has given you. I don't care all the accomplishments and all the applause that you have received. I think that the core of any person that is claiming to be a leader that represents Jesus is to, to model Jesus through him. And the moment I see, I, I, you know, it's very easy to identify because you start seeing like trends and tendencies and behaviors that are like, what is this person is unreachable. Now he has like this court over him that he's not, he's not moving without and I understand security and protection and all that, but you got to keep things like at ground level. You cannot allow this power to consume you and to take you off the, the, the real calling because true servanthood and calling has to do with giving yourself for others. So everything that takes place at that church should portray the sacrifice of the cross. If I don't see that from the get-go, I know there's some issues. There's something's out of order in that institution, and we need to take action. If if so, they won. You know, you cannot force anybody to accountability or to humble leadership. That's really between them right. and God. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of uh, an oxymoron to try to uh, uh, force somebody to be humble. <laughs> and I know so it is the the hardest thing I've heard in this study that I, I have been I have been researching for my for my thesis. Uh, so many cases, Jonathan, of leaders where they were already caught. Okay, there's no escape here. You, there's evidence. You were uh, misbehaving. You were acting out, and and still they don't want to submit through a process of restoration. I do believe that they need to sit down, to step down. Um, I don't think that taking away the job is the solution because we hurt. We. We've heard so many people, instead of providing restitution, we, we provide punishment for what they do. And I, I don't believe that's the heart of God. So there's some approaches that are being very unhealthy in the church and uh, unfortunately represents the church at large. But I think a, a, a wise church and a healthy church would actually work with that person uh, from the moment they realize that they are needing help. And they were going to provide anything in their power to restore their lives. I know a pastor personally. I know a pastor, a very, very close friend. Um, he had a very beautiful church and he had a moral failure. This is many, way, way many, many years ago. Big moral failure. Everybody knew the whole community, believers, non believers. It was ugly. It could not get any, any uglier than that. And he sat, Jonathan, for 10 years. 10 years sitting down, attending church. During this time, he, he took off a time like out of the country, 
uh, visited with a friend that that was life giving to him. And bottom line, to make the story short, the pastor came back. God not only gave him the church back to him. I say gave him the church back because he took uh, the role back as a lead pastor, senior pastor, but the church exploded. So the church, the ministry became larger and richer and healthier than it was uh, in, at the mm-hmm. beginning. So yeah, God can restore, but the leader has to submit and learn the power of submission in the healthy way and, and in, in the, hum, the with the humblest of spirits. I think God can restore your life in ways that you cannot imagine. So never fear. For those of you out there listening to this podcast, never fear confession. Never fear the power of restitution because God is a God of opportunities. And the only damage could be that you're sabotage, self-sabotaging the power and the potential that God has given you to become the best you that he has created you to be. Yeah. Well, Jorge, this has been a great conversation and we are about out of time. So just where can, where would you want to send uh, <laughs> listeners and leaders who are saying, I, I want to learn more about how to, how to do this well, how to uh, prevent these kinds of failures and burnout in my ministry? So Jonathan, the, the program, the Clara, is, is not 100% ready yet. I'm already, I'm still like in school wrapping up my, my last semester and present defending my case, obviously. Uh, that's happening in the next, so pray for me. <laughs> uh, but then the program is going to be available to, to churches and any, any institution, Clara. Um, so in the meantime, though, uh, you can uh, reach out at, at our regular practice, which is ccicounseling.com cciconseling.com. Um, and that's, you know, eventually we're going to put a link there to the page that's going to take it to the, to the, to the uh, accountability pro- program when it's ready. But in the meantime, we can help uh, with restoring, preventing, protection, protecting leaders from uh, burnout and moral failures. Yeah, that, that is our heart. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for the work that you guys are doing. And it's been really great to have you back on the program, Jorge. Anytime, my friend, you know, you know, we're family. We're in this together. Absolutely. And listeners, we're going to put uh, information uh, about Jorge and Denise's counseling practice in the show notes and some other links that might be able to help you, especially as leaders, to be able to know how to navigate this and and seek to prevent burnout. But we're always glad that you're with us and we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on the Pure Sex Radio program. Take care.